Good afternoon. I'm Susan Eisenhower and welcome to the Eisenhower Institute's uh, weekly series providing critical analysis of long-term issues. Uh, I'm talking about times of crisis today with Dr. Ron Fauché. Uh, what an enormous pleasure it is, uh, Ron, to uh, welcome you to this program. Uh, Dr. Ron Fauché is a nationally respected pollster, writer, political analyst, and he has a unique background in both government politics and the media. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I am a great consumer of his weekly uh, or his daily program called Lunchtime Politics, uh, which is uh, full of fascinating polling information that comes out uh, every day. And I know we're going to hear more about uh, Ron's series here. And he writes uh, columns for both um, newspapers in Louisiana and also the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Dr. Fouché uh, graduated from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, and he holds a PhD in political science from the University of New Orleans and a law degree from LSU Law Center. I just have to say, what an interesting uh, combination of uh, academic credentials. Uh, this obviously gives uh, uh, Ron an enormous uh, perspective from which to uh, address some of our questions today. Uh, he was uh, the youngest person elected to the Louisiana House of Representatives, and he's also served as editor and publisher of Campaigns and Elections magazine. Dr. Fouché has taught courses in presidential election history and campaign strategy at George Washington University and, and uh, Georgetown University. Uh, he has appeared on national network television. He's frequently quoted. He's an authoritative nonpartisan media uh, source on a range of issues. Now, uh, I think it's also worth noting that he's a prolific writer as well and uh, wrote um, and uh, was the editor of debate book, Winning Elections and Campaign Battle Lines. And he was a presidential appointment to the National Archives National Historical Publications and Records Commission. Wow. He's currently writing a book on Franklin Roosevelt. And of course, Roosevelt's a fascinating topic because Roosevelt ran for president not once, but actually four times. Um, and so uh, as tempting as it would be to um, have a, find out much more about Franklin Roosevelt's presidential uh, sweepstakes, uh, we've got one coming up ourselves here in 2020. And consistent with our idea that we are uh, living in times of crisis, um, I'd like to ask you, Ron, to maybe um, help us understand how this presidential campaign fits into uh, the, the time of crisis we're in right now. It, it seems normally uh, the presidents tend to win a second term when they're confronted with a national crisis of some kind. Uh, how do you um, assess the um, political landscape at the moment? And um, if the election were held today, how do you think it would uh, turn out? I think the you know usually the best way to analyze a presidential election is to start off with the last because that gives you sort of a benchmark to figure out where this is going uh, and compare it to where it had gone over the last four years. Um, four years ago, the presidential election was a protest election. Uh, it was mm -hmm. a change election. Uh, you had uh, conservative right wing. Tea Party protest against the hypocrisy of the Republican uh, establishment. You had left-wing liberal uh, protest against the corporatist Democratic establishment. And you had sort of middle of the road, independent-minded voter protest against the way government wasn't working and political paralysis and political correctness and in uh, the hyper-partisanship that had had taken over politics. So, so you had three big protests going on and Donald Trump was able to harness uh, one of them and ultimately the big part of the second one. So, so he was able to win really as a protest candidate. It's very rare that a protest candidate gets elected to public office, but Trump did it. Uh, when you look at the exit polling, you find, for example, that in the key swing states, over 80% of the voters in states like Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin uh, said that when they voted for president, change was more important than experience a good judgment, which is something that you would normally not see. <laughs> but, uh, 
So the 2016 election was really, it was a protest election in Trump better than anybody, uh, any of the candidates, Democratic or Republican, harness that. Now the 2020 election is actually now very different. It's not a protest election. It's not even a change election. What it is, is it's a, it's a referendum on Donald right. Trump, pure and simple. I hate to inform Joe Biden of this, but, um, but in, in some ways he's almost more of a bystander than a participant. Uh, because ultimately voters will be looking at Trump and voting for Trump or against Trump. Now, if Biden makes big mistakes and he picks a bad vice presidential candidate and, uh, and, and, and you know, doesn't come off well, then obviously that his negatives start becoming a factor. But at this stage of the game, excuse me, I have a, a, a puppy here who uh, has decided that the male person uh, is here, but anyway, the um, so so it's a very different election than it was last time. Uh, now, last time the election was really very close. Uh, ultimately, yeah. it came down to three states. Uh, you know, again, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, and Trump won all those states by less than a percent. He won Florida by a little over a percent. So even though he he had some room to spare. In electoral votes, it was really a very, very close election. And of course, he lost the popular vote by 2%. So going into this election, uh, you know, the, there's a few things to keep in mind. First of all, the question is, uh, and, and the thing to remember is Trump has held his base very well. And we all mm -hmm. talk about this, Susan and I have talked about this recently, that um, uh, almost no matter what President Trump does, good or bad or indifferent, uh, his, his base holds up with almost no change at all. So now that's, that's a plus for him because it, it keeps him in political contention, but it's also a minus for him because he isn't growing the base. He isn't mm. expanding. And um, so he got 46% of the vote last time. Hillary Clinton got 48%. He was able to win the Electoral College with 46% because he was able to carry, you know, those three or four critical swing states by tiny margins and not flip those electoral votes one way or another. And we've seen it before. President Bush won against Al Gore with less popular votes and so forth. Uh, so the question is, you know, if he only gets 46%, how wide can that gap go? before he starts losing the electoral college? And the answer is really, uh, if the gap gets more than about 3%, it, it may be 4% at the very most, uh, then he can no longer survive the, the popular vote deficit. Now, the big question in this election is, uh, how many people vote for somebody other than Trump and Biden? You see, in the last election, you had 6% of the electorate that voted for third candidates. And some of those people had they, some of those voters would have voted for the Democrat or the Republican had their alternative not been there. So the question is, if, if it's just Biden and Trump and there's only a few, maybe one or 2% who are voting for the third candidates, what happens to that other 4%? because the other 4% was the ultimate protest votes. Because they were voting, they were protesting not only the system and the politics, but they were protesting the protest candidates, you see. So the question <laughs> now is, where does that vote go, which makes this election a very close race? And just to make a long story short, uh, when you look at the individual state polls, by the way, anybody would like a uh, free subscription to lunchtime politics, which is our uh, polling newsletter, please feel free to go online at lunchtimepolitics.com. Just send us your email and you'll get it. And um, But when you look at the state-by-state -state polls, Biden is now in the lead in enough states to win the election, which means if the election was held today, he would win. Right. Now, it wouldn't win overwhelmingly. You'd have a bunch of states like um, you know, maybe Florida, maybe Arizona, maybe Pennsylvania, some of these other states that would be very close. But 
uh, if the election were today, I think he would win. But, uh, but the question is, you know, the, the point is, it's not today. It's in November. So where right. will it go between now and then? You know, the so um, can I just um, yeah, ask sure. you to follow up here about the impact of uh, whether or not to open or whether to continue to stay in uh, st uh, lockdown, as it were. I feel like I'm under home arrest, actually. But uh, um, is that likely to have an enduring effect um, on uh, the voters as we go forward? Well, it's very possible that it does. But, we, but to be honest, we don't know that yet because yeah. this is such an unusual situation. Uh, you know, to, first of all, when you look at the polling today, it's not any different than it was before the pandemic hit. Uh, mm -hmm. President <laughs> Trump's job rating is identical uh, before, the poll, before the pandemic hit. Biden was leading him by four, five, six percent. He still is. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's been very, very little change. And it's amazing that the Democratic Party could go from this big presidential race with 25 candidates down to one candidate, literally in a matter of a few weeks. And then you could have this global pandemic where, where almost 100,000 Americans have died now and, and hundreds of thousands of other people in the United States are, are sick and millions of people around the world. And it's involved massive government activity. Uh, the national debt is, is going way up. The budget deficit is almost incalculable right now. It's going right. To so, so these are big, big things. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're the stuff of the kinds of crises that, that presidents uh, going into war or during war of the Great Depression have dealt with. And, uh, and amazingly, amazingly, uh, it, and, I, and I'm speaking here as a neutral observer, uh, <laughs> and, and I'm not advocating for any of the sides. I'm actually an independent, so I'm, I'm an equal opportunity uh, critic. Me, me too. <laughs> uh, but, but essentially, it's amazing all of this has happened, and the basic politics really hasn't moved. Now, I think, and a lot of people think, there is a possibility that in a few months from now, voters will look back and they'll say, aha, this is the lesson from this past year and move one way or another. One of the things I've, I've sort of developed over time is what I call the kaleidoscope theory of presidential elections. That uh, like a kaleidoscope, you know, you turn it and it looks entirely different. But the voters, the, the pundits and the media analysts and people like us, we're turning it every day, looking at, well, what if it looks like this? What if it looks like that? But voters aren't doing that. They, every now and then, they pick up the kaleidoscope and they give it a turn. And we saw that happen uh, in the first week of March when Democrats were confronted with the possibility of Bernie Sanders being their nominee. And they said, wait a minute, this is scary. So they turned the kaleidoscope mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it had Joe Biden's picture on it. And they said, well, that's the safe way to go if we want to beat Trump. And, uh, and arguably the kaleidoscope hasn't turned since then. And, uh, but at some point, I think most people think it will turn because people will look back and say, you know, number one, did President Trump handle this crisis properly? Number two, even if he didn't, would Joe Biden handle it better? Or could he have handled it better? Right. You know, and number three, where do we go from here? You know, th this coronavirus crisis in terms of budget deficits, national debt, uh, unemployment, business, small business, education, infrastructure, all of these things have, has had a big effect. And, and so the question is, is it a temporary effect? where things sort of get back going, but they call sort of the big V effect. Things are up right, here, right. put out here, but then they go back to where they were, or if it's a very slow coming back. And, and, we, and nobody knows that yet. You know, this isn't- So Ron, I'd like to just, um, actually, you're, you're on exactly one of the uh, follow-up questions I wanted to ask you, because um, I think we haven't actually, uh, you're right, we haven't seen the 
um, the impact yet of some of the policies we've adopted, but it seems like one of the trickiest things, and I don't really understand why the Republicans are holding out for not providing relief to states uh, that are on the verge of going bankrupt. It seems to me that this is where uh, voters are really going to feel an impact in a very significant way because um, actually the state and local governments are now responsible for so much of this uh, uh, crisis response. Do you have any thoughts about that? We're lucky to have uh, somebody who's not in Washington, D.C. to uh, offer a thought on that particular point. Well, you know, that has now become a partisan issue, which is a shame. Yeah. Uh, and so it's now looked at as Democratic, you know, blue states versus Republican red states. But, but I think what's happened, I, I mean, I think both sides have screwed this up, as usual, in my opinion. Uh, on the one hand, if the, the three trillion dollar uh, program that includes help for state and local governments that the Democratic House passed the other day, uh, if that was all they had passed and all they had done, I think they would have a strong issue because they could make the claim that, you know, that, well, like you were just talking about, uh, you know, that if this isn't done, there's going to be massive tax increases and economic problems of state and local governments and law enforcement problems, infrastructure problems, everything. Right. And, uh, but instead they filled the bill up with a lot of other programs that really uh -huh. have nothing to do with the coronavirus. It's become a grab bag. So now the Republicans have things they can attack in that bill that has nothing to do with the, with the core of what the bill was supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what they call a message bill. They knew that bill couldn't pass the, the Republican controlled Senate. So they said, we're gonna just load up everything we want and go tell voters around the country, well, we were for all of this and the Republicans were against it. And then on the other side of the coin, now that gives the Republicans an excuse not to do what they should be doing <laughs> in terms of trying to help state and local government uh, get through this thing. So, so, so this thing here is a perfect example of why Washington doesn't work. That both sides go too far, they reach too far, they're only worried about politics and the next election and less so about the next generation. Now they won't tell you that, but I just did because I believe it's true. <laughs> And, uh, and so, so, so that's where we go. But, but local governments, now, you know, in fairness, the last uh, recovery bill, the $2 trillion bill, did have significant money for state and local governments. The problem is, is that it had some strings attached that it probably mm -hmm. should have had, uh, because a lot of local governments and state governments right now are trying to figure out, well, how can they justify this for coronavirus relief when that's not our problem. Our problem is that our sales tax revenues are down and um, in, our, in our income tax revenues are down. So, so th they basically need general fund money to, to get them through this hole. And unfortunately, Congress is talking about everything but that right now. And hopefully at some point they will get together, maybe have some compromise legislation and get it through. But uh, as it stands now, we're, you know, we're in the middle of another political war that, uh, that is paralyzing action. Well, it's, um, it's, it's actually rather frightening. I mean, I'm not even gonna say rather frightening. I know how the British use the word rather. It means like uh, not so much. No, this is, this is frightening. A lot of people are worried about the state of our uh, democracy, that we have a non-functioning Washington that's insensitive to uh, the direct problems of uh, people who um, live close to our communities. So um, there's a lot of anxiety I'm hearing here in Washington about uh, the election itself. Uh, right. And uh, now doctors are predicting that we're going to have a second wave of the coronavirus sometime this fall. Um, we've got a United States Postal Service that is not uh, being supported uh, by the Republicans uh, and a president who says that he thinks um, uh, mail-in ballots are illegitimate. Um, where does that basket of issues take us as we get closer to November? Uh, you know, again, it's hard to say. 
Uh, you know, the election process in this state is run by the, uh, in this country is run by the states. You know, we really don't have a national election system. Uh, it's a state system where the states get together and they figure out what they want to do. And then they send electors to go vote for president. And how those electors are picked uh, depend upon the state legislatures. For example, you know, the state legislature in Pennsylvania could decide we're not going to have an election. We're just going to going to meet and we're and the legislature is going to elect the legislators and I, I elect the presidential electors. And that's it. And we're going to send them to Washington. Of course, is that they, possible? It, could they do that um, under well, our system? Well, constitutionally, sure, they can do that. Wow. They used to do that, and uh, but it, you know, it's not likely. I mean, you'd have a hue and cry that would be unbelievable. But right, uh, but it certainly could happen. Uh, I don't think it will happen. I think ultimately, you're going to have a, a an election system that will be pieced together, uh, and you'll have. You'll have more male voting, the male meaning M A I L voting, than mm -hmm. before, uh, more um, um, early voting than you've had before, and uh, and in some cases maybe some online voting. Uh, it uh, it scares me to think that that would happen in a presidential race, uh, where the mechanics are can be so fragile and subject to breaking down as we saw in the Iowa caucuses earlier this year. But, um, but nevertheless, uh, I think you're gonna have, you know, a, a patchwork here. Uh, and, and I think some of the states will do a good job and they're gonna work hard and be careful that, that they give people an opportunity to vote. And at the same time, they won't open the door for too much shenanigans in the process of doing it. And uh, so we hope so, but it's going to be a big difference. And look, if the presidential election or a Senate election or a congressional election uh, has a big margin, then none of that will matter. But if the presidential election is close, you know, if you end up with two or three decisive states where one of the candidates has a very small margin, as we saw in the last election and in, and in many elections, uh, then these voting techniques and machinery, that becomes the issue. And, and the last thing this country needs is, is that kind of a problem. Oh. And ultimately having the Supreme Court, as we saw in 2000, pick a president in effect. Right. And, uh, and given the, the, the polarity of opinions on President Trump, uh, that, you know, the, the, the opportunity for division and uh, and in real problems, I think is is great. So let's hope it doesn't get to that point. But as it stands now, things are rolling around. And uh, I've been in touch with quite a few election offices around the country. And I and you know, and there are some uh, who uh, secretaries of state and elections commissioners who, regardless of their partisan affiliation, are honestly trying to do a good job. And they're trying to come up with a system that respects, uh, you know, the health needs of people in the current situation, uh, as, as well as as uh, you know, to, to get people to vote. And uh, so, so, what are the prospects? What are the prospects that um, we could have either side calling the results um, not just um, well illegitimate because of the way they were conducted. We're already beginning to get some of that flavor here. And as you know, last week, uh, there was a supply, surprising comment from one of uh, Donald Trump's children that, uh, no, it was Jared Kushner actually, who said um, that uh, at the moment, yes, this, is, uh, this election is scheduled for these dates. Uh, maybe for our listeners, you could say something about uh, the process uh, for assuring that the elections are going to happen on time, um, and also, um, anyway, some kind of uh, speculation on your part, if you're willing to do it, um, about um, what a post-election period might look like if we, um, you know, have some tight races. First of all, you, you may remember that Donald Trump, before the election day four years ago, talked about how he might challenge the results. Right. And he won the election. And he was the first candidate who ever won a presidential election 
who claim that fraudulent votes were cast in the course <laughs> of the election. Uh, as you may recall, I think he said three to five million fraudulent votes were cast. And he was trying to make the point that he really won the popular vote, even though he didn't. And, uh, and you know, it, it, we had never, you know, we have seen a lot of people say, uh, recount, this isn't fair, but we've never seen somebody say, the election was a fraud and I won, you know. <laughs> yeah. That was a different thing we had. You know, and on the other side of the coin, uh, Stacey Abrams, who is, was the Democratic candidate for governor of Georgia, who lost the election by 55,000 votes, still to this day claims the election was fraudulent. And a lot of people support her and have been giving her a lot of money uh, to her, her foundations and nonprofit groups to campaign about that and campaign about the election process. Mm -hmm. so, so both sides are raring to go on that. And uh, so we'll have to see what happens. But uh, ultimately, the political self-interest may control some of this because mm -hmm. the red states uh, that will vote for Trump, they are generally controlled by Republican governors and legislatures. And they want their state's votes to count. They want to have the election on the right day, and they want to have the electors elected without any uh, controversy. So their votes will count. On the other side of the coin, the Democratic blue states, you know, they're generally controlled by Democratic governors and Democratic legislatures, and they want their votes to count, you see. So ultimately, the, the, the personal interest, the partisan interest of these two groups uh, may actually move people in, into trying to do this job right and responsibly. Now, the big question is where you have these, these seven or eight swing states that right. have Democratic governors or you know, Republican legislatures, and they're sort of in the middle of the game here. And that's where the, the problems could be. So uh, let's hope it doesn't happen like that. But so um, back to you, you did raise a very important uh, question there about uh, um, governors, state houses. Uh, how do you think uh, the voting is going to go with respect to Congress? Do you see any big shifts there uh, in the Senate, in the House? Could either of them flip? Uh, yes. Um, Usually, uh, there tends to be a ground zero in an election. Two years ago, the House was, was ground zero. That's where the action was. And that flipped. That flipped from Republican to Democratic. I think ground zero in this election will be the Senate, not the House. Mm -hmm. I think the Democrats hold on to the House. And uh, unless something catastrophic happens, and of course, something catastrophic is happening, and it's not changing <laughs> much. So who knows? But um, but right now, the Republicans have a a three seat majority, and um, and they have more than three seats that are at risk. They probably have five or six states right now that, with Senate seats that are at risk. So um, uh, I think there is at least a pretty good chance that the Republicans will lose the Senate. It's, it's hard to predict the Senate races in advance because they usually get down to, you've got four or five really close ones that could go either way. But uh, if you wanted to, to bet on, a, on a, a bet, make an early bet right now, and had the odds, I would vote that, that the Republicans may lose the Senate, even if Trump wins the presidential election, because you wow. may find that some of these swing voters or as I call them, cross-pressured voters, uh, may, may have a problem with Trump on some things. They don't necessarily want to go to the Democratic side either because they feel that the Democratic side has gone too far to the left. So they may say, well, we'll vote for Biden and the Republican senator. So, uh, so, so those kind of things can happen. But, there, but the Republicans have more weak incumbents right now than, than the Democrats do in the Senate. In terms of the House, uh, you know, you might have some changes, but the Democrats, I think, may have enough seats where even if the wind is blowing against them some, they may be able to survive. Yeah. 
So we're, um, this is, I'm afraid, our last question. This is absolutely fascinating, Ron. Thank you so much for being with us. I'd, I'd like to just step back and sort of look at the 30,000 foot picture here. Um, and, and I was wondering if you could just, you know, as our sort of final comment here, say something about the cultural change you've observed in this country for all the years you've been writing these important books about the electoral process. And also, uh, are there likely to be um, any um, significant changes after this election? For instance, pressure to eliminate the electoral college or something rather fundamental and structural. But uh, I'd love your thoughts as we sort of pull away from this very specific discussion and, and help us frame how we might be looking at this election as we go into it in November. Well, you know, in terms of the big picture, I think one of the most interesting things that's been happening in recent years is that the country is becoming increasingly polarized, but more importantly, increasingly politicized. Mm -hmm. uh, we ran a poll in the newsletter, I don't know, some months ago that showed that a significant portion of voters say they depend on their personal happiness based on the political activities. We've got people now, particularly young people who are dating, uh, who say they wouldn't date a, a pro-Trump or a Trump uh, boyfriend or girlfriend. And so, it, so politics is sort of taking over the culture and it's because of technology, the internet, cable TV, social media. And it's also because of Donald Trump. Whether you love him or hate him, most people find him interesting. And he is sort of fascinating the whole process and dominating the whole process. So the political culture has become much more, much more uh, uh, politicized. The, the whole culture of the country has become more politicized. And, and you know, the, the, the big issues of how long can we go with a political process that is rapidly losing public credibility is a big question. I think the, the political process in this country uh, has lost a lot of legitimacy. And I think it's gonna keep losing a lot of legitimacy because too many people don't think it's on the level. And too many people are right about that because, uh, because the, 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 the public interest is often uh, subordinated to partisan political interest. And, uh, and that really has to stop regardless of where you are in the political spectrum. Right. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. I have to say, uh, Ron, I wanna thank you um, personally and on behalf of uh, the students uh, and the community of Gettysburg College and, and the larger world out there that tunes in uh, for EI Live uh, once a week. Thank you so much for being with us. All the best. Bye-bye. <laughs>